Let's get the day started with uh, the uh, literary criticism part. So yesterday and the day before, we discussed Plato and Aristotle. So we, in simple terms, maybe in a couple of sentences, I could sum it up as uh, Plato disregarded poets and he wanted to abandon them from the uh, public affairs. And uh, Aristotle uh, tried to defend poetry and he said that poets are equally important and the concept that Plato brought in was that mimesis or imitation is uh, far removed from reality and because it's removed from reality uh, it is trying to copy the original and the copy is never uh, as original as the original or as valid as the original whereas Aristotle tried to counter them by saying that uh, a copy has its own functions it is trying to present real as it is and it is not about representing what is at this particular time but then making the society future ready. So we had quite a lot of fruitful discussions yesterday and I'm sure you're all excited. So today let's quickly jump uh, to the inceptions of literary criticism in England. There are two more that comes in between that I have not touched. It's there in your blogs. You may read that uh, Plato and Aristotle are comparatively significant when compared to Horace and Longinus. So well, Gargi Goral, again, for that question, I have I already told you, I've given you the links of previous year assignment questions as well as uh, previous year question papers. So you may go have a look at that. Uh, by the time we come to our last class, hopefully we'll have a brief discussion on what are the questions to expect and how to prepare. Again, there are, I, I can't really predict what the questions could be because I'm not at all involved in that process. But then based on the previous year question papers and based on, because these are all cliched common topics, we can make some basic predictions which would help. So that we shall do at a later point of time. But for the time being, uh, we are skipping Longinus and uh, Horace uh, and we are quickly moving on to the inception of literary criticism in England. So talking about the beginnings of literary criticism, okay, again, before that, I would like to share a link with you as well. Uh, I wanted to play that in the beginning of the class instead of a song. This is Plato's, yesterday we learned uh, Plato's allegory of cave, the day before that is. So there is this Plato's allegory of a ring. Uh, not that pertinent, but then if you want, you may have a look at at a later point of time. Okay, so as we get the day started with, uh, let's talk about the beginnings of literary criticism in England. When I say this, it doesn't mean that's where literary criticism began or that's what uh, is all about. But then we always speak about certain selective readings, which are prominent due to various reasons, maybe because of the reach that it got, maybe due to the social political scenario, maybe because of the power hierarchy and the privilege that the writer enjoyed. There could be several reasons, uh, which we don't really need to explore at this point of time. But then for convenience, for the sake of convenience, we have certain starting points. For instance, when I say Plato and Aristotle, they are not the only people who would have written. But then for convenience, because they are popular and they are important and pertinent to us, we, we look at their theories. So similarly, when we speak about, well, before speaking about the origins of English literary critical tradition, let me give you one more uh, interesting analogy. This is something I spoke about you on day two. The moment we speak about the origin of anything, we can draw a convenient apparatus origin of dash, literary criticism, drama, poetry, whatever. And then you can subdivide it into uh, ancient and modern. And again, you can subdivide it into classical and modern. So uh, that subdivision I have already spoken to you. So we have discussed classical literary criticism pertaining to Aristotle, Plato, Longinus and Horus. Moving on to modern English literary criticism or English literary critical tradition. Uh, again, let me talk to you about how maybe in a special way the Britishers are copycats for its sake. Uh, you take about any genres and trace the origins of that genre in England. You would observe that those genres were primarily about uh, you know, copies of what had already existed elsewhere. Let's speak about poetry. You speak about epic poetry or lyrical poetry. It had its inceptions in Greek or Greece. And uh, later you could see it taking 
new shapes or forms in Hindu. A classic example I always discuss in my class is that of uh, sonnets. I'm sure most of you would be familiar with the term, especially in MEG1, you would come across a few sonnets. So where did sonnets originate as a form? Just a five minutes of time, we'll come back to it later. So where did sonnets originate as a form? Sir, France. No. I think it was Italy, sir. It is Italy, yeah. It was Italy. So who was the first known proponents or exponents of the sonnet form? Petrarch. Petrarch, spot on. So uh, sonnet as a form originated in Italy. Uh, Petrarch kind of championed the sonnet form. What was the structure of a Petrarchan sonnet? And by the way, what is a sonnet? How many lines are there in a sonnet? 14 lines. 14. Yes. 14. Yes. So if MEG1 was full of sonnets, you would all be very happy. In Probably starting, it was like six, six, six paragraphs, two paragraphs divided into six, six lines. Okay, okay, I'll come to that. Don't worry, I'll come to that. No, no, no. It's not paragraphs. Uh, when you speak about poetry, what, what, do you, what do we call that? It's not paragraph. Stanza. What do we call it? Stanza. Exactly. So please be wary of that. We, a lot of students make this mistake. It's, uh, it's not a fault, okay, Noor? It's not your fault. But I'm just trying to bring this to your attention because I know quite a lot of students who unintentionally uh, end up writing paragraphs. It's not paragraph. Uh, poems are divided into stanzas. So when it comes to the Petrarchian sonnet form, there are 14 line poems divided into two stanzas consisting of eight and six lines each. Petrarch divided his sonnets into two uh, stanzas. The first stanza consisted of eight lines and the second stanza consisted of six lines. What are they called in terminological terms? Those uh, been octave two and sustained. Yes, octave and sestet. Very good. So the first stanza was called octave and uh, the second stanza was called as a sestet. Later, in the early half of the 16th century, um, sonnets came to England. Uh, Viat and Surrey, uh, Surrey uh, Earl of Surrey and Thomas Viat, Sir Thomas Viat, W-I-A-T-T, um, brought sonnets into England. Total's Miscellany was one of the first publications on uh, sonnets anthology collections that was brought out in England. And uh, sonnets changed its form when it reached England. It, it got to its zenith through William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare, when he wrote sonnets, divided the sonnets into three how many standards. stanzas? Yes, not three, it's actually four. Four, uh, three. three stanzas three. of four lines each. And yeah, three couplets. and a couplet. And a couplet, not two, a couplet. Yeah. Three quatrains and a couplet. I'm glad you're using good terminology here. So four lines each, stanzas. There are three stanzas. And there is this concluding couplet that William Shakespeare brings in. So there are quite a lot of people, including teachers, who believe that or who uh, are mis who misunderstand that it is Shakespeare who's brought this format and who's invented the couplet, which is not true. Uh, much before Shakespeare, there is another uh, English writer, English poet, who wrote sonnets. Just a second, I'm sorry. Uh, so there is another um, English poet who wrote uh, sonnets, and he was the one who dared to break free from the Petrarchan sonnet tradition. He experimented with what would be called as the 662 tradition, which you may call as a sestet, sestet couplet tradition. Philip Sidney did write uh, sonnets, but then this was a bit more perfected by, not Surrey, but another poet that you may not probably think of at this point of time. Yes, Edmund Spencer. So Sir Edmund Spencer wrote uh, sonnets. One that I could um, mention is, uh, on the strands, I wrote her name, or one day I wrote her na name upon the strand. Uh, it's a 14 line sonnet, and uh, it was divided into two sestets and a couplet. 
you could see quite a lot of parallels between sonnet number 114 of william shakespeare with the narratology that is there in one day i wrote her name um if you remember so, sonnet number 114 by william shakespeare uh which is which, which which begins with the title uh, with the lines let me not to the marriage of true minds it ends by saying if this be proved upon wrong uh nobody ever writ uh, i never written nobody ever something yeah that's how it ends so it is more like shakespeare uh, stands in a court defending love and he says that love is like this love is like that and uh, if you can't account for the emotionalities of love then Uh, nobody has ever nobody has ever loved nor have i ever met but much before shakespeare uh, spencer has acknowledged this uh, role that literature has a poetry has in making uh, people eternal so in that he writes to his beloved he and his beloved actually go to a seashore and write their names so this, the, the the waves come and wash their names and the beloved taunts him saying uh, what a fool you are you write our names and it gets washed away and you keep writing and it gets washed away uh, we can't be permanently written here and then spencer out of absolute love tells him you can't have more you know uh, that's how romantic in a way these early british writers were the sort of fantasies that they had so she says that uh, whatever happens at the end of the day our love shall live through my writings i'll i'll write and make our love eternal so that's what spencer did um yes i'm already yeah so that's something that i would just like to give you as a cross reference so shakespeare then uh, worked on that and uh, brought this 442 structure which became even more popular and accepted so let's not get too detail again her uh, shakespeare has written 154 sonnets which uh which 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 um uh, you may if you feel like go and read um well um, what exactly is question or did i didn't get your question so what does actually romantic means as in english terminology as you uh, say that is romantic is romantic i can't understand what is romantic well uh it has various meanings based on context and uh, where you place it historically for us when we say romance or romantic we speak about love love that we may share with someone uh, in a mutual way but when it comes to english literature and when we speak about let's say uh, romantic literature or romantic period that that refers more to uh, a, a group of people including william wordsworth samuel taylor coleridge uh, percy bysshe shelley john keats and lord byron who went on to write a streak of poems on a um, specific pattern i'll come to that pattern later uh, if i get time today or maybe some other day and it's more about a pantheistic view a nature based rustic poet that that i'll come to later that, that has quite a lot of attributes that romantic has actually nothing to do with the uh, affectations between lovers so don't get confused it's it's not as complicated as you think uh i'll try to come back to all that a little while later so i was trying to talk to you about the beginnings of literary criticism in england so when we speak about england the first noted attempts at literary criticism sparks off with sir philip sidney again when i say this please be cautious it doesn't mean that sidney is the first one who wrote a critical work because sidney's writing in itself was a response to uh a work called the school of abuse by stephen gosson it is similar to the plato aristotle debate so stephen gosson speaks uh, against or condemns the uh, writers particularly dramatists and he says that they are all immoral and filthy and useless and they need to be condemned and then philip sidney comes in defense of the writers and he tries to bring out or trace out uh, how an ideal writing should be but then sidney's defense is not exactly against gosson alone it's also against all the charges including those laid by plato so as you read more you would be able to draw parallels between quite a lot of these writings about what say for instance happened between stephen gosson and uh, philip sidney later what dryden writes and then la- later what happens between uh, let's say um, samuel taylor coleridge or uh, matthew arnold uh, 
and uh, the sort of defenses that they bring uh, for, for uh, towards poetry and poets uh, can be parallelly read. So that maybe we'll come back at a later point and uh, draw analogies. For the time being, let's get started with Sir Philip Sidney. Again, not part of an assignment question, but then I'll quickly rush through Sidney because Sidney is significant to you. So what happens with Philip Sidney is also something that you need to be aware of. Um, there is this uh, writing by Stephen Gosen titled The School of Abuse, written in 1579. Uh, which was a charge on the Elizabethan stage, Elizabethan theater. And Philip Sidney tries to defend his compatriots uh, by evoking such a, uh, again, again on a rational, logical grounds. As I told you, you can again see this later with Shelley, Shelley who writes something called Defense of Poetry. So that will come to later. For the time being, let's uh, get started with Sir Philip Sidney's Defense. So Sidney's work was published in 1595, titled The Defense of Poetry, I mean Apology for Poetry. And uh, what exactly is or does the word apology mean? In modern era, the moment I say apology, apology means sorry. But back then, the word apology had a, a different connotation. The word apology meant defense. So Sir Philip Sidney wrote uh, a, P, uh, a work of uh, criticism called uh, Apology for Poetry, which meant in defense of poetry. Again, later, next week, we'll discuss uh, Vindication of Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft. The word vindication also means defense, so def in defense of the rights of women. So two similar words from two different uh, you know, starters of critics. And uh, it's something that you may misunderstand if I don't try to clarify. So Apology for Poetry by Sir Philip Sidney is something we'll get the day started with. So in the Apology for Poetry, he explains how poetry became, becomes the cradle for civilization, a channel for creative power, a medium for teaching and delighting, combining the virtues of history and philosophy. As I say this, please note certain terms that keeps repeating from Plato onwards. Right? A channel for creative power, a medium of teaching and delight, you know, instruct and delight, so teaching and delighting, combining the virtues of history and philosophy. Again, history is a word that you will come back again later with T.S. Eliot, who speaks about historical sense. So Sidney goes on in Apology for Poetry to refute the main arguments raised against poetry. He writes that in defense against Stephen Gosson's School of Abuse. Biographically speaking, Sidney was not only a poet, but also a man of the world and a typical Renaissance figure. We don't have too much of time to discuss uh, Renaissance and its attributes, but you may just go back to any of the basic books available or even the web sources available and Google what Renaissance is. So Renaissance would uh, talk to you about a rekindling of a spirit. So there is a revived spirit towards everything, towards arts, towards literature, towards travel, towards uh, military power, towards accumulating wealth. So Sidney was that man of Renaissance who sought learning as a power. So Philip Sidney was a typical Renaissance, uh, Renaissance figure, just like, say, for instance, Sir Francis Bacon, for instance. So um, in his work, he answers both contemporary and platonic criticism of poetry. I've already told you that. Like he does not simply answer Gosen's critic alone, but he also answers uh, Plato's critic of uh, criticism of poetry. His work is more synthetic than original, but what, but what he brings to the table is more polished to what his precursors have said. I already told you, uh, people like Plato or Aristotle has already discussed the relevance of writers and art uh, already. But then, uh, so that's why you can't say Sidney is really original in his concepts. But then he brings in his own perspectives and terminology to defend whatever he has to say. 
it's more realistic and more analogical evidence based empirical is a better word empirical uh, is what he empirical research is something that he attempts to So, in defense of poetry, what is it that Sidney says? So, let's say there are ten to fifteen things that he speaks about. He argues that poetry is the light giver, a cradle of culture and civilization. Again, go back to Plato's cave. It's not directly about uh, poetry; it's about education. But Sidney talks about poetry as a light giver. According to Sidney. the poets are the first lawgivers the first historians and philosophers we had this brief discussion yesterday towards the end of the class about the art versus science debate so sidney being a poet himself speaks about how we are torch bearers of all these things the pre socratic wisdom was in verse form so as the many books in bible even plato uses metaphors and poetic figures which functions as a skin of his philosophy in a wonderful analogy sidney compares poetry with a passport like passport that prepares us to travel to foreign destinations poetry prepares us for the reception of learning look at the analogy that he uses you know people like socrates or plato have all modeled on comparisons and poetic figures in one way or the other and then he says that poetry is like passport like you can travel from one nation to another using a passport poetry also prepares us for the reception of learning it's far more true in today's times you read a poem you come across a new culture you come across their systems their way of behaviors their myths uh, and the occurrences that's there in that country so that becomes really equally potent he equates the men who attack poetry to the sons who rise against their father see again uh, an emotional analogy is brought there those who attack poetry are like the sons who revolt against their father the power and craft of poetry are the same sense as the divine in the antiquity poets were seers and verse the language of prophecy again these are all verbal dialogues uh, beyond that maybe you wouldn't make much sense of it he is just being analogical but he says that jo likhte the wo sant jaise the and uska bhasha tha bhavishyaka so he says in antiquity poets were seers s e a r s and the verse was the language of prophecy again go back to aristotle aristotle we discussed yesterday he says that it's not about what happens today it is about getting them prepared for tomorrow so poetry has a prophetic function poetry has a commitment towards the future so sidney kind of underlines the same he goes on to say that it was poetry that empowered king david to express and embody the divine majesty ordinarily whenever we feel to capture the divine essence we switch to poetry he draws quite a lot of allusions from bible because he was a christian writer as well more often than not being a christian critic he had to answer attacks from both the realm of philosophy and theology against poetry it was not that only philosophers critiqued poetry or poets but even theologists had critiqued poets so being a christian sidney had to answer those charges as well so he draws examples from the holy bible itself he says king david expressed himself using the uh, poetic form then he draws example from epistle to paul p a u l and says how poetry was used effectively poets are like gods because can anybody tell me why or what is the similarity between a writer and supposing god exists uh, god what is one superpower that god and the writers share 
the creators exactly so we create and just like god's poets also create and sydney reminds stephen gozen and the likes that uh, poets are like gods because they create while all other art forms take the inspiration from nature poetry alone improves upon the natural world in that sense poetry touches upon the divine and so mimesis is a higher kind of imitation again that mimesis debate that started with plato continues with philip sidney centuries later we are talking about 16th century ad here so so he goes on to say that poetry transforms beasts into tameable cyclops men into heroes and bronze into gold again this is use of metaphors this is just verbal diary if you want to call it so but then he is using these imageries to say that poetry can make a huge impact a long lasting impact he goes on to say that it is poetry that philosophy that then philosophy that brings back the golden age poetry makes everything new is an aphoristic quote that philip sidney uh, brings up he says poetry makes everything new it has this transformative power the power of regeneration so he goes on to say that what the poet imitates is not nature itself but a more perfect idea in the mind to which poet gives a shape or form in this he is more indebted to neo platonist plotinus the end of the poetry is to teach and to please we have seen this to instruct and delight and please so the end of the poetry is to teach and to please because it imitates not how things are but how things should be or ought to be so he believes that the purpose of poetry is to teach and please because it imitates as aristotle has already said it's not about the present but it's about how it should be in the future i hope you are able to draw these analogies in case you are not able to follow feel free to let me know it inspires to scorn the vices of the villains and to imitate the virtues of its heroes poetry at its best makes us scorn or condemn the vices of its villains and imitate the virtues of its heroes although philosophy can distinguish the good and the bad its inherent lack of quality or warmth uh, refrains it from impacting us to seek the good and forsake the vices again an analogy between poetry and philosophy so he says that poetry makes us disregard the vices of the villains the faults of the villains and imitate the virtues of the heroes whereas philosophy even though it can distinguish between the good and the bad it inherently lacks warmth and refrains it from impacting us to seek good and forsake the vices he goes on to claim that poetry unites the universal precepts of philosophy with the particular concretes from history and thus it has the power to implant itself in our memory and judgment history repeats facts whereas poetry improves it again he uses the examples uh, of the parable of the lamp that prophet nathan uses against king david and tries to prove that history may repeat facts whereas poetry improves on it or helps us change a destiny this is not over here there is also a brief discussion on how sydney answers his critics there are three claims that sydney makes all right just before that let me just give you a few facts and then proceed to that because you may also yeah just a second let me just share the snippets of what i have told you so far so that you will be able to go back and have a look at it <clears throat> 
I'm not overcrowding you with facts. I'm just giving you what is important. This is available in the World Wide Web as well. So you need not worry just in case you're not able to retrieve this. This is not something that only I possess. This is not my secret treasure. This is just one of those sources that I depend. You can go to EPG Pachala and collect all these things if you want. Again, I'm also sharing those references that he speaks about just in case you want to go back and have a look at. All right, so let's move on. So Sydney's answer to his critics is threefold. First of all, he say uh, the charge leveled by the critics was that poetry is unprofitable. The second charge against poetry is that poetry is the mother of all lies. And the third charge is that poetry entices and leads to sinful behaviors. We have seen this across the ages from people like Plato up until Stephen goes. So these three charges did upset Philip Sidney. And unlike Aristotle, because Aristotle got offended more as a philosopher to a philosopher, but with Sidney, as I already told you, Sidney was a devout Christian and he had to address attacks from the theological planes as well. So these three charges were quite central to Philip Sidney's concepts of upholding to poetry. So Philip Sidney discharges or you know disregards these charges in the following manner. So the first charge is that poetry is what is the first charge? Are you guys here? Am I boring you too much? Poetry is unprofitable. Not at all, sir. Yeah. yeah. Poetry is unprofitable is the first of the charges that Aristotle, uh, sorry, uh, that uh, the critics make. And let me tell you, at this point of time, again, do not think at it from a classical perspective of Plato or Aristotle. Do not think, at it, think of it simply as Philip Sidney's defensive charge or Stephen Gosen's accuse, but also take it to the contemporary world. You as youngsters, if you write stories or if you are into films, you will come across these charges. Back when I was in my school days, in my 7th or 8th standard, I had this habit of writing stories. I used to write stories because I was quite bullied by most of the people because I looked really dark and in that sense ugly and I was short. So people used to bully me, including my teachers in the school. And uh, whatever gives us appreciation, we used to do. So I used to play the keyboard and I used to write. So these are two things in which I vented out myself. So back then, ever since I started writing, my literature teachers were always appreciative of me. And uh, some of my teachers were so generous that they went to other senior grade classes and read out my stories, which when I look back now were not at all good enough. They are substandard ones written by a 7th standard or 8th standard old guy. But then that gave me some sort of a confidence. But then when the parents meet or open house came, I still remember this quite distinctively. I had this social science teacher of mine. I remember I say that because it's not a science teacher. It's not a math teacher because those are subjects where I didn't score that much of marks. But a social science teacher of mine uh, complained about me to my parents and I still remember it was my mother who came for that uh, open house, 7th or 8th standard perhaps. She told her that uh, your child is into writing and have you ever heard of anybody who's made money out of writing? You should dissuade them from doing that. Well, I'm not taking this debate to the teacher or anything. Back then I didn't know that Shakespeare and Alexander Pope made money out of this or Chetan Bhagat had not started writing up until then. But nonetheless, but nonetheless, uh, the point I'm trying to make is when it comes to any new art or any art that is popular, that gives mind a lot of peace of mind, uh, there are people who charge, who level charges saying it is unprofitable, which may be true, but then we don't do everything for the sake of profit. We don't do everything for the sake of money. Uh, my guru, Dr. Rangarajan, always used to say, you, there is no difference between somebody paying me, let's say, 500 rupees for an hour and 10,000 rupees for an hour and maybe asking me to come and teach for free for an hour. 
as long as I get an audience that is interactive enough, I'll put in the same efforts to communicate to them. So profit is not the only motive that leads us forward. So for the charge led by people like Gosen, that poetry is unprofitable, Sydney retorts back saying that poetry is the fruitful out of all knowledges because it has a power to move its listeners towards a virtuous path. That is a, a, a diplomatic stance taken by Sydney. Because he has to answer the charges from two planes. Who are the two planes? Let me see if you are here. Yeah. One is philosophers. We know that. The second one is see these three charges. Poetry is unprofitable. Poetry is the mother of all lies. Poetry entices and leads to sinful behaviors are all charges by philosophers as well as Dash. You read the third point, you should immediately get it, even if you missed my class. Theologists, not atheists. Atheists won't say that they are more welcoming to anything. Atheists would often end up being anarchists. This is not the case. Here. The theologists have laid this charge. So that's why, that's why uh, Sydney makes a diplomatic difference. He says, Poetry is the fruitful out of all knowledges because it has the power to move its listeners towards a virtuous path. So again, he is talking about uh, morality, good way, and that the virtuous path is something that is divine as well. So biblical. So he, he draws theology into a diplomatic position. And the common sense, this should have come at the third charge, sinful behavior. But then he brings it in the first charge. Second, poetry is the mother of all lies. Again, just three repartees from Sydney. Number one, poets never lie, for they do not affirm. According to Sydney, the poets simply generalize things. They don't affirm anything. They don't say this is like this, this is like that. They just present things. So they don't lie. Second, poetry is like a stage that create illusions to form meaningful lessons. So he draws analogy with theater because Gosen's attack was on theater. So he draws this analogy on theater and he says that just like theater draws some illusions to bring out light, uh, poetry also sometimes have to draw some illusions to deliver meaningful lessons. Third, the party that he gives is that only fools confuse illusions with reality. That is a place where he kind of goes slapstick. He says, only fools confuse illusions with reality. Wherein he indirectly says that philosophers and theologists who are against poetry are fools. Yeah, precisely. So that's that's again the craft of writing. You know, if you have if you are creative enough, this is how you can kill somebody without taking a sword, without shedding a piece of blood, a drop of blood, you can kill somebody with your words or cut somebody with your words. Okay, so the third charge is that poetry entices and leads to sinful behaviors. So if you compare the three charges, it is the third charge that enrages uh, Sydney. It enrages Sydney because Sydney, as I already told you, was a devout Christian. And he was also a poet. It's like a, it's like a doubly problematic scenario. Traveling in two different parts. You know, Christianity goes this way and poetry goes this way. So Sydney, who was in the middle of both the boats, uh, quite, was quite affected by this third charge. So he spends a little bit more time defending the third charge. He goes on to say that it is not poetry itself that leads to sin. But the abuse of poetry like anything else in this world. It's not poetry itself that leads to sin. But the abuse of poetry like anything else in this world that leads to sin. He reminds that Plato kicked out the poets. But Sidney finds this as the hardest one to answer. He says, I can't understand why someone as legendary like, like Plato could even think of that. He reminds us that poets guided the philosophers in the past. 
he discovers a sort of an anxiety of influence in Plato, just like Longinus. Longinus also, while discussing sublimity, talks about anxiety of influence. Again, it's a term I would leave for you to go back and uh, read. It has also undergone several transformations due to the want of time. I shall for the time being not get there. But again, he brings in a biblical analogy. He cites Saint Paul quoting the pagan poets as opposed to pagan philosophers in order to defend Christianity. You got it, right? He says, you say that poetry is something that leads to sinful behavior. But if that be so, if poets are to be ba banished or banished from the court, then someone like Saint Paul should have called on the philosophers. But he didn't. Rather whom did he call? He called the pagan poets. So he draws largely from the biblical instances. Sydney ends with a curse on poetry haters. And that curse is quite interesting. There are two interesting curses that Sydney brings in as he draws close his apology for poetry or defense of poetry. He says, may there be no love for the want of sonnet. May they be forgotten for the lack of an epitaph. And he concludes his defense. Yes. Again, he also speaks about certain divisions of poets. So divisions of poetry. He uh, speaks about the three kinds. He reminds that there is something called religious poetry. Again, addressing to the theology theologians, he says that there is religious poetry too in praise of God. So how would that be leading to sinful behavior? And then he says that there is philosophical or informative poetry, which imparts knowledge of philosophy, history, uh, astronomy, etc. Then he speaks about right or true kind of poetry, where he says that true poets are truly creators. Then he goes on to list a few poems, a few genres, who, which he calls as the true kind of poetry. Heroic poetry, lyric, tragic, elegiac, that is elegy, elegi, then comic, satiric, iambic, pastoral, and epic. Of this, he rates epic as the best and the most accomplished kind of poetry, which inspires men to heroic action. So for all these categorizations, he gives certain reasons. Uh, for instance, he says that lyric enkindles, enkindles virtue and courage. Tragic reveals wickedness of men in high places. Elegy softens the heart and arouses sympathy for the suffering. Comic warns men against common errors. Satire loves folly out of the court. Pastoral deals with the low, low life and arouses sympathy and admiration for simple life. Hatred, and for, hatred for cruelty and tyranny and so on. So he goes on to defend all these things. And again, he draws distinctions between the philosopher, the historian and the poet. So all these things are significant when it comes to understanding the ethos of uh, Sir Philip Sidney's preachings. So I, I request you to uh, read Philip Sidney. There are times when you have essay questions on Philip Sidney and his defense of poesy. As I told you, it is already a disagreement which has made Shelley write defense of poetry. See, why would you defend something? Because there is someone else who is not doing that. Someone is laying a charge, laying an accuse. So Shelley writes in defense of that charge. Somewhat brings in similar points, gives new names. That's it. All What, what all these people do is they bring in the same concepts, give it a new topic, a new title. So nothing much changes. The situation changes. The people who lay the charge changes. The defender changes. But then this happens across the ages. We'll, we'll get to that if we get some time. Uh, we'll get time at, at a later point of time. For the time being, let me...
Yeah, let me just play a video for you. A high forehead topped by disheveled black hair, a sickly pallor, and a look of deep intelligence and deeper exhaustion in his dark, sunken eyes. Edgar Allan Poe's image is not just instantly recognizable, it's perfectly suited to his reputation, from the prisoner strapped under a descending pendulum blade to a raven who refuses to leave the narrator's chamber. Poe's macabre and innovative stories of Gothic horror have left a timeless mark on literature. But just what is it that makes Edgar Allan Poe one of the greatest American authors? After all, horror was a popular genre of the period with many practitioners. Yet Poe stood out thanks to his careful attention to form and style. As a literary critic, he identified two cardinal rules for the short story form. It must be short enough to read in one sitting, and every word must contribute to its purpose. By mastering these rules, Poe commands the reader's attention and rewards them with an intense and singular experience, what Poe called the unity of effect. Though often frightening, this effect goes far beyond fear. Poe's stories use violence and horror to explore the paradoxes and mysteries of love, grief, and guilt, while resisting simple interpretations or clear moral messages. And while they often hint at supernatural elements, the true darkness they explore is the human mind and its propensity for self-destruction. In the telltale heart, a ghastly murder is juxtaposed with the killer's tender empathy towards the victim, a connection that soon returns to haunt him. The title character of Lysia returns from the dead through the corpse of her husband's second wife, or at least the opium-addicted narrator thinks she does. And when the protagonist of William Wilson violently confronts a man he believes has been following him, he might just be staring at his own image in a mirror. Through his pioneering use of unreliable narrators, Poe turns readers into active participants who must decide when a storyteller might be misinterpreting or even lying about the events they're relating. Although he's best known for his short horror stories, Poe was actually one of the most versatile and experimental writers of the 19th century. He invented the detective story as we know it, with The Murders in the Rue Morgue, followed by The Mystery of Marie Roger and The Pearl of Lecter. All three feature the original armchair detective C. Auguste Dupin who uses his genius and unusual powers of observation and deduction to solve crimes that baffle the police. Poe also wrote sours of social and literary trends and hoaxes that in some cases anticipated science fiction. Those included an account of a balloon voyage to the moon and a report of a dying patient put into a hypnotic trance so he could speak from the other side. Poe even wrote an adventure novel about a voyage to the South Pole and a treatise on astrophysics, all while he worked as an editor, producing hundreds of pages of book reviews and literary theory. An appreciation of Poe's career wouldn't be complete without his poetry, haunting and hypnotic. His best-known poems are songs of grief, or in his words, mournful and never-ending remembrance. The Raven, in which the speaker projects his grief onto a bird who merely repeats a single sound, made Poe famous. But despite his literary success, Poe lived in poverty throughout his career, and his personal life was often as dark as his writing. He was haunted by the loss of his mother and his wife, who both died of tuberculosis at the age of 24. Poe struggled with alcoholism and frequently antagonized other popular writers. Much of his fame came from posthumous and very loose adaptations of his work. And yet, if he could have known how much pleasure and inspiration his writing would bring to generations of readers and writers alike, perhaps it may have brought a smile to that famously brooding visage. Check out this playlist for more videos in our reading series, and let us know in the comments. All right, so why was that video played? 
Why was this? Why was that to video say, viral? Yeah. To aware about Edgar Allan Poe's poem Raven. Okay. Why is Raven significant here at this point of time? Yesterday, yesterday, some of you had asked me about dark romanticism and transcendentalism. So Edgar Allan Poe is someone who is part of the dark romanticist tradition. So Raven is one of those poems which stands as a stand, you know, as a testimonial example of uh, dark romanticism. But that's not the only reason why I played that video. Uh, I'll come back to Edgar Allan Poe later when we discuss romantic literary tradition or criticism of William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. I actually wanted to discuss that today by skipping John Dryden and Samuel Johnson. But because we started 20 minutes late, uh, I don't think I, I, I should rush and complete it in 25, 30 minutes. So that's why I would keep it for our next class, whenever it is. So let me also give you a disclaimer. Um, our first plotted schedule ends today on MEG5. So there were four sessions taken. There are six more remaining. We won't have classes next week because it's a holy week in Kerala. We are having a festival called Order. So there won't be any classes next week. Hopefully, we'll have our classes resuming in the week after, which is supposedly the first week of September. Somewhere between 4 to, I don't know, maybe somewhere between 4 and 15, we'll have the sessions rescheduled. You will be informed over mail or through your groups. And uh, the timings would remain the same, 5.30 to 7.30. And we can meet over and continue our discussions on literary criticism and literary theory. So if things go as planned, I say as planned because I can only hope and we can only hope and we can only hope that this materializes the way we want. So if it goes as planned, in the next class, that is after a week, we'll be discussing romantic literary tradition. And at that particular point of time, we'll somewhere drop criticism. And from the sixth class onwards, we'll move on to literary theory. And uh, as time permits, we'll discuss Jacques Derrida, Roland Barthes. We'll discuss feminist literary theory. We'll try to discuss post-colonial literature and uh, whatever else we have time for, based on priority, if we get time limits. I.A. Richards and practical criticism is something I would like to deal with as well, but I'm not sure. But nonetheless, yeah, I said Derrida. Derrida is connected with deconstruction. Derrida, Paul the man, and so on. Of course, we'll discuss with we'll discuss new criticism as well if we get time. It's also an interesting topic. Maybe half an hour would be good enough to deal with. No, 5:30 to 7:30 is always how the sessions are scheduled. So hopefully we'll have our next class, if they reschedule it that way, somewhere from September 4th onwards. Or it could be from September 10th or 11th, I'm not sure. You will get the intimation nonetheless. But I, I believe that we'll have all the classes for MAG5, 10 sessions that is. Next week, Gargiji, we have a festival here. From 27th to 31st, we have an autumn festival in Kerala. So it is a public holiday, just like the Christmas week. It's full of festivities. So nobody goes to work. It's like a public holiday for all the 10 days. Chuti. So even if I want to, I'm not a chuti person. So even if I want to teach, they're not going to schedule sessions for those times. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. If, we, if and when we get time, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss whatever we can. So for the time being, because we have only another, say, 30 minutes, let me deal with two people which whom I would have otherwise not discussed. Not that they are not important. You may have questions from them as well. You may have short notes possibly. But then these two people are also not primarily known as critics. But they are known for several other things that they do. Including writing poetry, giving speeches, um, um, several other things. But before discussing them, let me also briefly discuss a historical turn of events between 1640 1660 and what happened afterwards. This is a decisive phase that you must be aware of. Maybe let me begin from William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare lived from 1564 to 1616. Then in 1630-32, his complete works were published posthumously. In 1640, 
a historical event occurred as a result of a series of something. What happened in England in 1640? The civil wars. Yes. So a, a, a series of civil wars ensued. And in 1640, the monarch of England, Charles I, was beheaded, guillotined. His entire family sought refuge in France. And maybe for the first time, monarchy was replaced by a Puritan regime under Sir Oliver Cromwell. If you are wondering what a Puritan regime is, it's more of an extremely absolutely religious form of living. Setting aside all the distractions including art, anything that is sinful apart, liquor, misbehaviors, um, arts, everything is taken away. And all that exists is a prayerful uh, scenario. So that is called protectorate. So under Sir Oliver Cromwell, from 1640 onwards, a protectorate was established in England. In the year 1642, which is also another landmark year, all the theatres in England were shut down. It's a landmark year because Puritans were against this. Censorship was there. So in 1642, all the theatres were shut down. Then up until 1660, this protectorate continued. To be precise, 1658, because in 1658, Oliver Cromwell passed away. But then he was succeeded by his son, Richard Cromwell, who ruled for a couple of years. And in 1660, by the time it reached 1660, the people were fed up. The citizens of England, the citizens of England were fed up with the monotonous religious way of life. They wanted excitement and entertainment and all sort of things. And uh, in 1660, that landmark incident is called as restoration. And from there, the restoration period begins in England. What do we mean by restoration? What is restored? The monarchy was restored. Yeah, in, in 1660, monarchy was restored in England. But unlike what happened in 1640, in 1660, there was no civil war, there was no battle, no bloodshed. Hence, it's also called in history as bloodless revolution, also called as glorious revolution. So bloodless revolution simply implies that the son of Charles I returned from France upon the request of the citizens of England. He came with his wife from France and uh, he acceded to the throne. So such a restoration process without bloodshed is popularly called as restoration. So in 1660, monarchy was restored and everything returned to England. The theatres were reopened. The king was a patron of arts. So writing became uh, encouraged. Patronizing began. Patronizing is, is something that you'd be easily able to understand. If I am a popular literary figure, I'll be having 10 to 12 chamchas under me. And they'll keep writing praises about me and they'll thrive on my money. So, uh, yeah, William, I'm sorry, I said Charles, I'm sorry. So William and Mary returned and uh, they were restored to monarchy. And uh, he was a patron of uh, arts and um, um, theatres were reopened. Quite a lot of changes happened in the theatrical arena of England. Up until then, uh, even during Shakespeare's times, quite a lot of things changed from the Greek and Greek or Roman tradition, but then there were still stage limitations. There was no drop curtain, there was no movable scenery, they had their own limitations uh, and all. But when, again, the most importantly, the female characters were played by men. All the Shakespearean female leads that we revel or admire were all played by, yeah, he was also called as Charles II. So all, all these female characters were played by adolescent men of 14, 13 year old. So um, when Charles II came back from France, he had a group of theatre artists with him. In France already females had started acting on stage. 
yes it were low profile women who acted on stage they were prostitutes majorly but nonetheless uh, when england was looking to break free from the repressive puritan rule uh, charles ii was the perfect icing on the cake theaters were reopened with women on stage drinking boozing and everything and england were relishing in this and then the political uh, factionalism also kick start so there was this wigs and tories yesterday while referring to battle of the books at uh, the battle of the books i had given this example so there are two opposing forces and they were constantly satirizing each other so to that genre or to that string of writers comes the poet of the poet who's also regarded as the first of the english critics despite it being another people he's called as father of modern english criticism john dryden john dryden was primarily a poet he was a poet laureate and uh, uh, john dryden was later followed in terms of poetry by alexander pope we call that period also as neo classical age or augustan age don't get carried away by these terminology they are really simple neo classical simply means what is classical classical refers to greco roman tradition so neo classical means new classical revival of that glorious era but for a different purpose aristotle and plato or horace and the romans and the greeks wrote for a noble cause whereas here the conventions of the classical era was used to satirize to ridicule because dryden and pope figured out that that is a better way of satirizing you go and read john dryden's mac flecklo it's prescribed in the mg1 if i remember correctly so mac flecklo is a is an absolute satire it is a ridiculous take on sir thomas shadwell who was the next poet laureate over there uh, in simple terms it is john dryden's uh envy towards shadow acha mala aldi parne kushumbu right he was the poet laureate he lost his poet laureate ship to thomas shadow so out of that you know uh, frustration dryden went on calling thomas shadow as the fullest of the fools to have ever graced on that throne. so in macfluck no the opening is like that it's actually it's, it's in the epic convention so that's why that's called mock epic I'm sorry, I'm teaching you MEG one in the middle of MEG five, but this is just to give you some insights. So, mock epic. So, what is a mock epic? You follow the epic conventions or the epic structure, and use it to the opposite purpose. Let's say, for instance, when Homer wrote the the uh, Iliad or the Odyssey, it was to praise the gods, then to praise the heroes, and show the entire machoisms. but when it comes to the neo classical writers the setting is the same the structure is the same the epic convention is the same but then they use it to ridicule the fellow comp- uh, competitors for instance in macfleckno when the poem opens there is this king macfleckno means son of fleckno so fleckno is the emperor of nonsense empire i hope you understand the satire fleckno is the king of the empire of nonsense bakwas ke samrajya ke badshah hai flakno and flakno has become old so now flakno has to hand over his mantle to someone else so because it is because it is the empire of nonsense flakno can only have a nonsensical son as the heir so as the poem begins flakno asks he has four four sons so he looks at the one and says okay you are a buddhu but you are not a manda buddhu he looks at the second one and says you are a manda buddhi but you are not as manda buddhi as me then 3 4 then he goes on and says okay my son you are the best one thomas shadwell you are the best one suited to come to my throne then dryden goes on describing the coronation ceremony so generally we have a red carpet reception when shadwell goes to ascend to the throne the entire path is decorated by 
the torn pages from his own books. Like he has written thousands of books which mean nothing, which are nonsensical, which are bullshit. So all those pages are being used to make the path for shadow. And there are quite a lot of satirical references. I leave it to you to read and enjoy. It is one of the epic masterpieces written by uh, John Dryden. Again, The Rape of the Lock is another instance. There are quite a lot of works in the more epic tradition. So Dryden started it and it was perfected by Alexander Pope. And when it comes to writing conventions, um, what was the name of that? Yes, uh, John Dryden invented the heroic couplet. And it was perfected again by Alexander Pope. Dryden invented the same not only for the sake of his poems, poems, but also for his dramas. He was also a uh, playwright and he wrote, he invented the form to suit his heroic dramas. He experimented this genre called heroic drama. So you may figure that out yourself. Let's quickly move on to John Dryden and his essay on the dramatic poet. The essay is something that you need to be aware of, as I told you. Because we have quite a lot of writers to study, not often that we come across an essay question from John Dryden. But it's not always the same case. There could be scenarios where it is also asked. So it is called the essay on dramatic poetry or poesy. It was Dr. Samuel Johnson who called John Dryden as father of English criticism, saying that he taught us to determine upon principles the merit of composition. Again, an empirical based analysis of uh, composition or metrics or writing. So John Dryden in his essay on dramatic poesy, gives an overview of the critical issues debated at the beginning of the neoclassical period of England. It is written in the form of a dialogue between four men who are stranded in a boat crossing the Thames at the eve of a great battle in 1665. Even though there are disagreements between these four men, as it is bound to happen, when there are you know, five fingers are like five different shapes. So when there are four men, they'll have difference of opinion. So even though they have disagreements, they seem to agree on three things. And these three things are not something that's really new. Again, for the Malayali audience out there, uh, that's why I keep telling uh, right from Plato to Aristotle to Sydney to Dryden to Arnold to Eliot to, Eliot, to Arnold, uh, you, you could see that there are concepts that are repeated again and again, again to Shelley as well. So in Malayalam, there is this popular karika meme, right? They say, fresh, fresh, fresh. Yeah. So you can see that as well. Look at the three things that uh, all these four men agree upon in Dryden's postulations. Art is a form of imitation. What do we call that imitation? From Plato to Aristotle to Sydney, what do we call that imitation? Guys, sir, my message, my message, my message. Yeah, yes, my message, my message. So art is a form of imitation, my message. Art should teach and please. We've heard this several times: to instruct and delight, to teach and practice. Yeah. So art should teach and please. It should also follow the rules of decorum. It is decorum that makes Dryden's writing a little bit apart from all these people. So he speaks about the significance of decorum. So there are three concerns as we have seen. So uh, the first concern of debate within the boat is ancient versus modern playwrights. One of them says that we are all ill copies of the ancients. I already warned you, this debate continues for ages. So in that boat, these four people debate and uh, a person says that we are all ill copies of the ancients. Our merits are theirs, but our faults are our own. Well, that makes quite a lot of sense actually. 
So let me just share this with you as well, just in case you want to go back and have a look at it. Compared to Aristotle or Sidney or anybody else, this is something that could be written in gold. We are all copies of those who were before us. Our merits should actually belong to them, but then our faults are accountable to our own. I told you yesterday that all those teachers who inspired me have all been legends. So I can never be them. I can only be a trace, a copy of them. So whatever good you like in me, the credit goes to them for molding me in that way, for shaping me in that way. But then whatever faults you find in me, maybe I'll have to put my hands up and take account of that. Okay. So that's what uh, the passengers in the boat speak about. The second man says, the modern writers are at an advantage since we have both nature and ancients to copy from. So because we have a set example, we are in that sense privileged because we have models to look upon and copy and correct. The conversation gets a little more heated as they reach the subject of the three unities. Again, going back to the Aristotelian concepts of three unities. The three unities of time, place and action are given its full fledged shape by the French playwrights and critics. Unity of time, stage time should be, should mimic the real time. Unity of place, action on the stage should be confirmed to a single place. Unity of action, there should be a main plot that is not complicated or diluted by the intervening subplots. We have discussed this yesterday. So this was perfected by French theatre after, let's say, the BC ended and the AD began and maybe during uh, Shakespeare's and Dryden's times, it was followed by the French theatre. So again, the parallel has to be drawn between French theatre <coughs> versus English theatre. I'm sorry. So, the parallel is drawn by the passengers on the basis of the three unities. And they conclude that the English theatre is better than the ancients, although they respect the ancients and they are not afraid to part ways from them whenever necessary. And that's very significant. I had told you yesterday, even though the classical Greeks like Aristotle had put forward the notion of three unities of time, place and action. William Shakespeare bravely walked away from that. He, he uh, didn't follow the time, place, action tradition except in the Tempest, which again was a swan song. So uh, the passengers observe that they respect the ancients, but they are not afraid to part ways whenever necessary or make amends. So the moral of the essay is that the ancient should be followed when they stick with nature. But if the rules of decorum lead us to abandon the nature, they must be altered. So in accord to the times and in accord to the situation, this could be altered. Neoclassicism keeps rules and decorum as a guide to help poets stay on course. So again, it could be seen as a defense of their satirical attempts. Neoclassicism follows the epic convention and dilutes them to a satirical effect. So Dryden says that it is their way of standing in accord to the times to guide their poets into that particular way. And with Dryden, again, uh, earlier we saw with Sydney that Sydney says poem or the poet does not give conclusions. He just suggests. With Dryden, we can see a precursor to Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes later says that the author is dead. This is the reader receptions which is important. Dryden also goes on to say that, say that uh, the readers can decide the merit of a literature or what the poet says. And uh, he stands for you know, uh, why these sort of a, uh, responsibility should be taken seriously by poets across the ages. 
that kind of sums up our discussions on Dryden. Uh, we don't have so much of time, but I would quickly like to mention Dr. Samuel Johnson. Dr. Samuel Johnson is popularly noted for his biography of 52 poets. And uh, he has defined poetry. He uh, spoke in defense of rhyme and blank verse in particular. He was high praise for William Shakespeare. And he wrote something called Preface to Shakespeare. So these are all just references. If you want to have a look at, uh, you may see, there are passive references in the blogs as well. So you may just have a look at that. So before we take your questions in, let me just share a video with you because there would be a few who have doubts on the anxiety of influence, which I mentioned a little while ago, the concept of Plato's allegory of the ring. So I'll just share that and then we'll take questions if any. A ring with supernatural abilities tempts its beholder with power. But there are no hobbits, dwarves, or Valkyries in this tale. In fact, the legend of the Ring of Gyges appeared long before those characters were ever committed to paper, more than 2,000 years ago, in the Greek philosopher Plato's Republic. The story surfaces as the philosopher Socrates and his student Glaucon discuss why people act justly. Is it because it's what's right, or because it's a convention that's enforced through punishment and reward? Playing devil's advocate, Glaucon argues against Socrates and recounts the following story. Long ago, a shepherd named Gyges was tending his flock when an earthquake struck, ripping an opening in the ground. The chasm drew Gyges in. There, his eyes alighted upon a bronze horse the doors to its central chamber ajar. Peering inside, Gyges discovered the corpse of a giant. On its finger, a golden ring, which Gyges pocketed before retracing his steps. Later, he sat among the other shepherds, fiddling with the mysterious ring, when, suddenly, after absent-mindedly twirling its stone, he became invisible. When he turned the stone back in the opposite direction, he reappeared. Emboldened by the ring's powers, new possibilities bloomed before him and a sordid plan hatched in his mind. Gyges became a messenger to the king of Lydia and, inside the palace, used the ring to prowl undetected. He seduced the queen and convinced her to betray her husband. And soon, Gyges, once a humble shepherd, had murdered the monarch and claimed the kingdom. Glaucon tells this story to illustrate how people can apparently benefit by acting unjustly. After all, wouldn't any rational person act like Gyges if presented the opportunity to get what they desired without consequence? Exploring this argument, Glaucon breaks all good things into three classes. The first kinds we desire for their own sake, like the experience of harmless pleasure. The second we want only for the value they bring, though they may be onerous, like exercise or medicine. The third class comprises things we desire for their own sake and the value they offer, like knowledge and health. Glaucon argues that justice belongs to the second class of good. It's a burden that nevertheless brings rewards. The only reason anyone conducts themselves virtuously, he reasons, is due to external influences. So it's appearing, not actually being, virtuous that matters. Socrates, as written by Plato, disagrees, countering that justice belongs to the third class of good, offering both extrinsic and intrinsic benefits. Socrates argues that the human soul has three parts, reason, spirit, and appetite. Reason guides an individual to truth and knowledge and is influenced by either spirit or appetite. Spirit is righteous, ambitious, and the source of bold action, while appetite consists of baser, bodily desires. To Socrates, the philosopher is led by reason and their spirit keeps their appetite in check making them the most just and the happiest. 
Even without consequences for self-serving wrongdoings, they wouldn't commit them. Meanwhile, the tyrant succumbs to appetite and acts unjustly. So while Gyges may have attained power and wealth, Socrates implies that his soul would be in disharmony. He'd be enslaved to his own base desires rather than guided by reason and wouldn't be truly happy. Before Plato penned this discussion, Chinese philosopher Confucius similarly reasoned that by simply acting justly, one also benefits oneself. After, modern Western philosophers voiced varying beliefs. Thomas Hobbes, for instance, argued that the state of nature is violent and selfish. Justice, therefore, is imposed by authority. John Locke, in contrast, asserted that people are naturally obligated to act justly and they agree to participate in civil society to secure their natural rights. The allegory of the ill-gotten, magical ring that lures its wearer towards their darkest desires continues to inspire. So if the ring of Gyges fell into your hands, what would you do? Would you try to resist its power like Frodo and the One Ring, or be corrupted like Gollum? Step into J.R.R. Tolkien's magic. Wow, so that's a hell of a question. What would you do if you get the ring? Let, before opening the floor, let me also add one more thing. We discussed catharsis yesterday. And I did mention that uh, even though Aristotle coined that term and spoke about the emotional purgation that the audience would get eventually, I doubt how much that catharsis would have been initiated. Because first of all, because his tales were limited, as I already told you, there were only a few legends the stories that were built by these playwrights. So by the time the audience goes to play watching, they knew what the story is all about. Let's say if they go to watch the play on Oedipus, they know how the story is. It's going to be the same. So when they anticipate that outcome, how far is that going to impact them to a catharsis is a question mark. It is further crippled by the use of heavy costumes, lack of movement and action, and the heavy masks used by the Greek actors. For instance, you have seen me act yesterday and you, most of you appreciated me saying it was good. So when I cried saying, what would my mother do without me? Who would she fall? Uh, which shoulders would she have to fall on? It was impactful to you. But imagine me saying it with this sort of a mask with very little option to uh, work on my voice modulations. Well, I use this for Dr. Foster's. No, he didn't use a mask. I just used for Mephistopheles. There's a character called Mephistopheles who makes uh, Foster's do all these things, including signing the deed. So I use this mask to enact the fist of All right, some other day if you teach MEG too. But then imagine a mask like this and the character having a conversation. That too in a worse form, not in a dialogic form. So imagine what sort of an impact it would create in you and how far would you end up being in that cathartic moment. So this is one thing I wanted to add. I couldn't do it yesterday, I missed it out. But then I thought I'll do that. I actually wanted to do it today when we begin. I had kind of, that's why I changed the entire background. And I thought I'll light up the session right away. But then they just spilled water over all those preparations. Ah, 20 minutes of wait time really killed me. Okay, so the floor is open. If you have any questions, we have another 10, 12 minutes. You may feel free to open up. Let me also remind you once again that our first streak of sessions on MEG5 ends today. Next week we won't have class because it's Onam Festival in Kerala. But after that we'll definitely have a resume. You'll be intimated via mail or the messages in groups. And uh, we'll come back again and discuss further literary criticism and theory. In our next class we'll discuss the romantic literary tradition. William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Percy Bysshe Shelley. That's something we'll discuss next week. I mean, next time when we meet, and then we'll talk about the Rida, Barth, deconstruction, uh, debt of the author, postcolonialism, feminism, and whatever we have time for new historicism. Yeah. Yes, please, go on. Yes, sir, because you won't come back to Sydney, so kindly discuss this eight part classical oration. I will come back. Why not? <laughs> because of the lack of time, sir. So.
<laughs> let me see, let me see. When I come back, I'll definitely do that. Don't worry. We have a few more theories coming up, so I'll connect them all. Don't worry. Excuse me. Yes, please. Just to clear my doubt that this Philip Disney is not part of MG5. Uh, Philip think, Sydney, uh, not Disney. Philip no. Sydney. Philip Sydney, yes. Yes. It is not part of uh, MEG5 syllabus. Is he not? I don't, I am not sure. Is he not? Okay, okay. Because he, he, he starts this English literary tradition. So, um, okay. I, I think so. At least there should be some passive reference. If it's not, I'm really sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely double check. Nonetheless, this is important for you. Thank if you. you. If you proceed further. Yes, yes. Uh, I, no, just I want to clear my doubt. That's all. Yeah, I think he's there in block one. I, I remember that. Because even when I used to teach offline classes. Uh, excuse me, sir. It's there in unit two. It's there in unit okay, two. Okay. I'll check up Fair the block enough. once. It's there in unit two. A part of it. Okay. Yeah, they cannot miss it from what I understand as well. It is important. Sydney is quintessential to discuss. Uh, if, you, if you have to speak about British literary criticism, Sydney is quite important over there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sometimes it so happens that when you don't read through the blocks, I end up confused. Like, okay, because I think a lot of, in quite a lot of places, at times I end up thinking, okay, am I messing it up? No. Because I don't really read these blocks because I know the theories, I know concepts. So I just go on that, you know, gut feeling and whatever research I do. I don't really go to the block in detail because from the vantage point that I am in, I don't really need to go to the block. It's 2.2.1 in block uh, two, that is. 2.2.1, you have Philip Sidney. I remember having seen it in one of the essay questions before. That's why I distinctly remember that. I look at the previous year question papers and assignment questions. And that's why I also distinctly remember that. Yes, kind of Zafar. Yes, uh, my question is, also, can you throw some light on different sects of uh, Christianity, like uh, Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, and Roman Catholicism? Well, it well, I think I, I, well, well, I think I'm not too good at uh, throwing light at the uh, religious divisions. But there is one thing I would like to enlighten you about. Why are you sorry about? Well, it doesn't matter. There is no need to be sorry. And that's okay, that's okay. That happens. Not a problem. It happens. Mike unmutes and we hear bizarre things. Then what about the lady? It's okay. It's totally fine. Uh, the point I was trying to make is, because you asked about religion, there is a popular misconception among most of our English learners, especially if they are non-Christians, that is, uh, even I had this misbelief for a long time. Uh, the non-Anglican English, I mean, non-Anglican students of English literature have this misconception that England is a Catholic country. This is not true. Uh, England was, in a in a major way, uh, ruled by or uh, had a had a major share of Presbyterians as its share. So Presbyterians, you can Google. Uh, so back during. The Elizabethan era, for instance, uh, Catholics were actually subjugated. William Shakespeare was a Catholic. Alexander Pope was a Catholic. And they had restrictions. Just like, let's say, uh, the Chaturvarnya system works in India, or used to work in India. Uh, the Catholics didn't have uh, allowances for public worship. They had to pay taxes, extra taxes, and they were bullied upon and so on. So uh, Presbyterians had the majority. And... Uh, Catholics were subdued. Then you would come to hear about Jacobites. Jacobites is another term that you would come across. And then you would also come across, uh, of course, Catholicism, Presbyterianism, Jacobites. There's one more I wanted to say, but I forgot. Okay. But then a basic Google search would give you details about these things. Yes, again, that's one thing that needs to be remembered. Jacobites refers to those who were during the times of King James. And that too, again, because King James had a, uh, King James had a mixed uh, you know, relevance. He married from another religion and uh, his wife was not a Presbyterian. 
and then there was a followers of James versus the church. So there is this opposition that leads to that being called uh, um, Jacobite revolution or rebellion. Okay. So I leave it to you, your basic Google search to do that. Or there are quite a lot of nuns in our uh, class. So I think they'll be able to enlighten you a lot more on that. I must tell you that I'm a pure agnost and I don't follow any of these religions per se. I do not disregard them either. Unlike atheists, I do not say that God does not exist. There could be a supernatural being, well and good. But then I'm not in approval of people uh, taking advantage of God and superstitions. I believe that man can equally be a shaper of... So if the there is a God, if there is evil, there is God. Possible. So as I told you, this is a very, very, very complicated thing and uh, I don't want to... Uh, I believe, sir, on. actually I believe that uh, in human being there is a evil and there is a God. We it, it depends on us which power we make more generative. If we generate our negative power, we became evil. If we generate our godly power, we became like something like saint and all. Yeah. Uh, kind of suffer. See, you guys are overlooking a lot of facts. Uh, and that's why certain questions come. I, I, I'm not discouraging you from asking questions. But sometimes, please look at the commonsensical things that's in front of you before, you know, unnecessarily overthinking certain things. When did Aristotle and Plato exist? What do we call that era? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what did we call that? BC. What is BC? Before Christ. So how could before people who how could people who lived before Christ be Christians? Right? So yeah, I, I, nothing against you. Okay, nothing against you. Before the birth of Christian, Christian, Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay, so you, you can't be a Christian before Christ, right? So yeah. So no, they were not Christians. Okay. I hope this makes you think and uh, uh, work a lot more on this line. Thank you so much and good night. See you sometime soon.